so they have my presentation down as Mod Kids, um, and this is, I guess, because I work on a project called Mod Kid, and I work with kids. So I'll tell you a bit about Mod Kid and, and my work with kids, and uh, I'm, then I'm going to go on to talk about why we do this, not what we do. Um, so Mod Kid is kind of a new uh, programming environment where we're trying to make programming more accessible for everyday people. Um, and if you see there on the screen, um, it's basically trying to take what would be text code and wrap it in this graphical way where it makes it a little more friendly. Um, and it looks a lot like Scratch, if you guys have seen uh, Scratch. Um, but it's actually for physical computing, as Walter said. So it's where kids can actually get out into the real world and, and program physical things, program motors, um, you know, to react to sensors and so forth. So um, that's basically what ModKit is, and I'll talk briefly about that at the end. And we'll be doing workshops. If any of your kids are uh, in the workshops, they'll um, be working with ModKit. <clears throat> and uh, the work we do with kids is uh, also pretty interesting. Um, uh, I've been blessed to kind of uh, be involved in a program called Learn to Teach, Teach to Learn. Uh, it's in Boston, uh, where I reside. And basically, the program's model is to take uh, 50 high school kids every summer and pay them to learn about technology, build with that technology, and then go and uh, reach younger kids. So the, the high school kids, their job is to teach this stuff to uh, elementary and middle school kids. Oops. All right, so what I really want to talk about is kind of why do we do this stuff and you know, what, what generation are we actually in right now? I've heard this like Generation X, Generation Y. I could never keep track of what generation I was in. So I'm going to use this term Generation D. Um, and the D is for digital, it's for democracy, and it's for DIY. All right, so I grew up kind of in the, uh, the mid-beginning uh, of the digital generation. Um, so this is where we started getting access to uh, digital devices, right? These were things that, that were essentially out of the reach of everyday people. Um, and, you know, there were actually hackers, um, you know, do-it-yourself people, hobbyists, that actually decided to take and, 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 and find ways to make this cheaper. Um, so this is a newsletter uh, from one of the most famous clubs of the time. It's called the Homebrew Computer Club. And uh, many of you might know this. This is where Apple came out of and a, a number of other uh, startups in this space that kind of revolutionized, uh, you know, revolutionized the space. Um, so, you know, the Homebrew Computer Club is interesting because, you know, if, if we were going to have a computer in, uh, in every pocket, which is what we have now, every pocket in every uh, purse, uh, or at least on every desktop, there must be something people are, are, are going to do with this stuff. So, you know, these are the early adopters that uh, figured out what we were going to do uh, with computers on every desktop, in every purse, uh, in every pocket. And it, it turns out they were just kind of having fun. So they weren't really, uh, you know, showing us what the killer apps or applications were for the space. They were just having fun with it and, and really wanted to just get, get access to the stuff. Um, so I called this slide uh, from, from Hobby to Hollywood. And it's not that, that this stuff actually made it to Hollywood this early, um, although uh, Steve Jobs ended up leaving Apple and, and co-founding Pixar, so maybe it's uh, a little bit true. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But, you know, this is where these hobbyists took their stuff, right, which they were just kind of showing off for free. You know, they were willing to share the ideas, the designs with, uh, you know, fellow hobbyists. And they actually started companies around this. So this is the first Apple. This is the Apple One. Um, and what's interesting is that it actually sold as a kit. Um, it wasn't something that you would go buy packaged. It, it looked like this, right? And, and the important part was, you know, what it did, not how it looked. I mean, if you look at an Apple nowadays, it's really, it's both, right? It's form and function. But this is really about function. Um, and, and it's also interesting that, you know, if you look at the form that it actually took, people actually made these things by hand. So, you know, this is a, a, an early Apple One. I think this is in the Smith, Smithsonian um, now on display. And this is, you know, homemade. It's made with uh, wood. The case is made with wood. And you actually notice, like, I guess there's a main supply there. Um, you know, a main supply right there. I'm not sure if I want my kids playing with mains power, but, you know, but this is what people were doing at the time. Um, and then I think, you know, this started catching on as a business, right? People were actually buying this stuff. Who knows why they were buying it, but, you know, this, this technology was actually useful for something or, or was at least interesting. Um, so it, I guess it got a makeover. It got a pretty case, not as pretty as the, the common uh, apples of, of today, you know, but it, 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 was, it was turned into a real product. And people started catching on. So I actually just uh, did a little research um, on this error and found this interesting quote. 
Um, it's from uh, Popular Science of March 1978. And it, it's basically a, a presenter that uh, an editorial was written about a presentation that happened in Boston. Um, and the presenter said, I want to make a prediction. Not everyone in this room will have a computer of his own in three years. Some of you will have two, right? And, and this might not sound crazy right now, but it really was crazy at the time. Not only, you know, did we have to find, you know, ways to make this cheap enough so that everybody could have one or two computers, but we had to figure out what are we doing with this stuff, right? And, and, and the article goes on to talk about, you know, what were people doing at the time with personal computers? You know, they were writing BASIC. Does anybody know what BASIC is? I guess a few, a few people of the era there, okay. Um, so, you know, the basic requirement essentially was that you had to learn some type of programming um, to, to make use of these computers. Uh, but the article goes on to talk about how this day will pass. We, we don't need to actually program to use computers, right? Um, so this, this goes on to, you know, has me thinking about what is computer literacy. And, and in the article, there was actually a really nice quote by the same gentleman that, that made the prediction about, um, you know, two computers in every home. And it says, at one time, the privileged man was a literate man. The literate man of the 20th century will be someone who understands programming. You will not be literate, sorry, you will be illiterate if you cannot do some, some, some sort of programming in the next few years. And, you know, now I hear about people talking about computer literacy, and it means using Microsoft Office, a word, right? That's not really truly being literate, right? But at the time, this is how you interacted with a computer, right? It was text-based. I mean, you might not be programming if you're using uh, DOS at the time, but you had to understand, you know, how was your computer set up? You know, uh, you, know you had to know things at a lower level um, than you do nowadays. And then, the, you know, the, the graphical desktop showed up, right? And this allowed us to have applications, right? This is it's pretty interesting because not, not much has really changed since this time. This is the, the early Mac, um, first Mac interface. And not much has changed since this time, right? We basically interact with the computer in the same way. This, this idea of a desktop, you know, with uh, overlapping windows, um, thinking about how we organize things on a typical desktop, this is how we're, we're now interacting with computers. Um, and, you know, it's interesting that this came out in 1984. The next year we had uh, Windows. Um, and, you know, it took, it took a while before this actually caught on where computers were actually in uh, every house, right? And I'm going to fast forward a bit. So I'm going to go to a, a time that I will call the, the, the democracy generation, right? And this is about access and participation. So if the digital um, generation was about access alone, access to digital devices, right? Now it's about participation. How do we actually get people, you know, to use this to kind of participate in, in a global space? And, you know, the first step was actually democratizing the internet. You know, the internet that was used for, uh, you know, military purposes was now being used for such things as Tim's amateur rocket, rocketry website, right? <laughs> you know, this is pretty interesting. Um, you know, the web browser hasn't changed since then, but maybe the content and how we use it has, right? So in Tim's amateur, uh, amateur uh, rocketry uh, web page, right, you know, it, it took some sort of coding to get this web page together. So... We weren't at the point where people could actually just publish their own stuff without any knowledge. Um, so things started changing. And we started democratizing pretty much everything, right? We democratized commerce. You know, it, it doesn't take much to set up an eBay account and to go out and, you know, sell whatever it is, any excess goods we have, you know, to the world. It's no longer just, you know, a corner, uh, you know, a yard sale, right, with, with, with a little reach. It's, you can reach the whole world with, with whatever you're selling. You know, and then we went on to democratize uh, publishing, you know, the blog sphere. Um, you know, it doesn't take much now to, to put together, um, you know, a blog and, and basically talk about anything that we choose to talk about. And it may not be interesting to a lot of people, but it may be interesting to some. And, you know, this low barrier of entry is what, you know, makes this, this whole space really interesting. And then we went on to kind of democratize all of information, right? Wikipedia is an interesting story. Um, I remember my, uh, my mentor is a, a gentleman by the name of Mel King in, in Boston. Um, and we do a lot of community work, in, and he has a, a long history of community work in, in Boston. And I remember in about 2005, 
we looked up and there was no article about Mel King. And this is a guy who was at least at a local level, pretty prominent figure, um, you know, basically was a politician locally um, and, and, and made it to the na national stage with a, a mayoral campaign um, in the late 80s. <clears throat> so a friend of mine put up an article and it was just a stub. So if you all use Wikipedia, you know, you might see this, this page is a stub, you know, help us, you know, uh, help us improve it. And, you know, two days later, we looked back and there was this whole long article about Melkin. Um, and, you know, this, this is really interesting for me because it was my first kind of introduction to how this, this whole thing was working, right? You could, you know, collaborate with other people across the world to put together, you know, documents about important things, important times, important places. Um, and and my, my kind of intro to this space is through fabrication technology. So around 2003, um, a professor from MIT started something called the Fab Lab Project. Does anybody know about this, the Fab Lab Project? So basically, the Fab Lab is this idea that um, digital fabrication, right, the idea that you can um, design something in a digital CAD file and then print it out, this should be accessible to all people. Right? And this is actually my son in 2004, 2000, sorry, 2005 or 2006, and he was about five or six at the time. Um, and, you know, he figured out that he could design, um, you know, this little, I guess it was a, a trolley car or something, put his name on it. And, you know, when he realized this, you know, he realized he could make a bunch of them. He ended up um, making dozens of them. Um, you know, I guess he didn't, he didn't get a, a market for it, but it was interesting to him. Right? Um, and then we started seeing hacker spaces, right? So this idea of a fab lab uh, took hold, and, and people were, were setting up these kind of new, uh, I guess they were just like the homebrew computer club, um, except they were hacking with computers. They weren't um, just hacking how to build computers. Um, and an interesting project that came out of the, the, the hacker spaces, that, that last picture was actually the, uh, the NYC resistor hacker space in Brooklyn. And the MakerBot is actually a project that came out of this. So this is a 3D printer um, that is kind of interesting because for about $700, you can get a kit, excuse me, and it's, it's very much like the kit that you would buy for the Apple one. It's similar in price. The Apple one was $666. This is $700. And you notice that it's made out of wood, right? So I see these parallels between these two spaces and times. But it's, it seems there's something missing. So if, if this whole space has been democratized by programming, right, if all these things, whether it's commerce, uh, whether it's uh, publishing, if all this has been democratized by programming, right, why can't we democratize programming itself? And I, I kind of left out some slides in, in this time frame um, because we're starting to move there, but I don't think we're, we're there yet. So in 2001, uh, there was a, a project called Processing, uh, which, which came to me in 2001. And this is a visualization. So artists are actually using processing to do art, right? So they're doing programmatic art. Uh, so these are not programmers per se. These are people that just have some artistic vision about what they want to do with this stuff. And this is you know, a very beautiful um, example of, of how you can use programming to kind of visualize sound in this case. And in 2005, another project came to be called, uh, called Arduino. And it was built on the processing uh, ethos. And it was also built on the processing development environment. So you would go and program in the same way that you could program uh, you know, your visualizations, you could program physical things. So you could program your motors, your lights, your sound, um, you know, and you could do that based on sensors in the real world. And then we saw this environment called Scratch. And Scratch um, is a, is a kids, pro kids programming environment. So we actually see that kids are actually able to take you know, all this stuff uh, whether it's, you know, sensing things in the real world or sensing the keyboard and make interactive games and animations uh, with Scratch. If only my uh, clicker would work here. Um, so we came up with some design goals about what it was going to take to really truly democratize digital, right? So if digital was this democratizing, uh, you know, energy, how could we democratize it itself, right? So how could we democratize digital innovation? Uh, so one of the design goals was to make it web-based. And this, this was based on what we saw with, you know, all these tools that we were seeing, you know, were all based on the web. So you had this kind of collective power of, of the world working together to kind of help you solve your problem. Um, and the other piece was that it had to be graphical and text-based. 
Um, so we didn't want to just take something that was going to work with, um, you know, just for kids. We wanted something that, you know, actual hackers could get, get involved in because we saw this kind of power of people working together uh, to solve these problems together. Um, so again, it's going to be kids and hobbyists uh, together. If you can kind of put together this environment that has both text and graphics, right, as a way to, as two different programming paradigms, you could actually get this larger group of people working together. Um, so today, we're going to be working with the kids um, with a project called ModKit, as I said. Um, and, you know, this, this actually takes these ideas. So we did it in the web, and this is kind of, uh, in 2008, this was kind of early to be pushing these type of applications, this type of graphics in the web. Um, but the web is kind of caught up. So, um, so now this is, this is how ModKit looks. You can run it in a web browser. And the interesting part is that we have a one-to-one -one relationship between the text and the code. Um, sorry, the text and the blocks. So you can, a kid can go and work in something that's kind of friendly and open, and then, and then see that it's actually programming underneath. So the question now is, what, what does the future hold? If, if, this, you know, if we've seen all these democratizing um, forces coming from programming, right, what happens when we democratize programming? So I'm going to make my own little bold prediction, right? So I'm not going to say that everybody in this room is going to program, but I'm going to say in, in 2015 that I think we'll have the tools where if anybody decides that there's something that, you know, something you can buy off the shelf doesn't do for you, that you'll be able to go out and figure out how to program that yourself, right? So it doesn't mean that you're all going to want to be involved in this, but if you do, if you want to learn the basic of today, right, there will be tools that will allow you to do that. So that's my prediction, and uh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.